I'm Matt Florence and you're watching my History Channel video, Britain's Vietnam, the Malayan Emergency, let's go. Now what was the Malayan Emergency? Now the Malayan Emergency was a war waged by the British against communist guerrillas who were fighting in Malaysia for independence. At the time of this war, Malaysia was a colony of the British Empire. It was very heavily used for mining and rubber plantations which the British used in the country and extracted profit for the empire from Malaysia. The communist guerrillas, the Malayan People's Races Army, fought for independence between the years 1948 to uh, 1960. They fought the British for independence, but they lost. So let's go into some of the background details of this war. Like I already said, Malaysia was a British colony. It was heavily used for its rubber plantations and its mining plantations, which were very useful to the British during World War II. One of the main reasons that the British Empire slowly dissolved was because they racked up so much debt during World War II that they couldn't pay it off, and this was a very opportune time for people to rebel against the British Empire. And this is what happened in Malaysia. In Malaysia, the British treated their workers terribly after World War II. What they did was they, uh, the real wages of Malaysian workers, rubber plantation workers, fell by a whopping 80%. And when Malaysian workers and trade unionists tried to protest against this, many of them were open fired on by the Malaysian colonial police and killed in cold blood. In response to this brutal treatment of the Malayan workers, the Malayan People's Races Army and the uh, Malaysian Communist Party fought for independence against the British Empire. During World War II, the Malaysian Communists, led by a man called Chin Peng, fought alongside the British against the Japanese who had attacked the British colony of Malaysia. Working alongside the British and the Allies, Chin Peng and the Communists, which were funded by the British Empire during World War II, fought and defeated the Japanese invaders. Chin Peng even met Lord Mountbatten, the supreme commander of the Southeast Asian forces of the Allies during World War II. And here's a picture of him shaking hands with Lord Mountbatten. Lord Mountbatten would later be killed by the IRA. So, in 1948, the Malayan Emergency started. It was not called a war. It was called the Malayan Emergency and not the Malayan War because if war was declared, then Lloyd's insurers would not protect the British corporations, mining plantation owners and wealthy industrialists and rubber plantation owners that ran the country. Their profits would not be protected if the word war was used. So that's why it's called the Malayan Emergency and not the Malayan War. In 1949, China successfully accomplished a communist revolution. Chinese people, Han Chinese people, were an ethnic minority, but they made up about 10% of the Malaysian population, and they were the hardest die-hard supporters of the Malaysian communists fighting against British colonialism. This was because revolutionary ideas, inspiration and supporters were coming from China to Malaysia to educate the uh, nomadic uh, immigrant workers, the Chinese immigrant workers in Malaysia. So how did the British respond to this? The British Empire set up internment camps to lock away the Han Chinese people in isolated areas so that they could not support the communist guerrillas. The communist guerrillas would get food, clothing and supplies from rural villages by befriending the villagers and then they'd go off back into the jungle. So the British Empire uh, burned down the crops of these Han Chinese people, these uh, vag vagabonds and vagrants as they called them. They took the Han Chinese ethnic minority and put them in internment camps called New Villages. The new Villages were, as we said, internment camps, but the villages were allowed to leave only a couple of times a day so that they could harvest uh, rubber trees and uh, take the rubber and then give it to the British Empire. You know, a slave labour camp almost. There were other ways of controlling the Han Chinese population, the Malaysians, to make sure they didn't rebel. One of these was to limit food and water to the new villages. They would also try their very best to block all communications outside the new villages. The new villages were guarded by British soldiers and Malaysian security forces, make sure that no one could leave. The villages were surrounded, they were slums, by huge barbed wire fence to make sure that nobody could leave when the British didn't want them to, and they cut all communications with the outside world so that they couldn't support the communists or hear news from anything that was happening outside. I already said they limited food, they limited communication, they limited water, they put harsh restrictions on the villages. 
Uh, according to secret colonial documents by the British Empire, there were a lot of complaints by women because British soldiers were strip-searching them to make sure that they weren't hiding supplies, which could later go to the communists. In very extreme cases, the British army would go into villages and kill every man to make sure that they couldn't join the communists, and then they would leave. And one of the most infamous cases of this happening was the Scots guards massacring people in the village of Batang Kalai. And the families of the victims of those who were massacred in Batang Kalai village are still fighting for justice till this day. And do you know how the British government responded? By seemingly trying to destroy British colonial documents to make sure they didn't have enough evidence and denying it for years after the massacre. Internment camps, massacres, killing trade unionists and communists who dared to fight for independence. Another method which they'd use was defoliants. Now we know about the defoliant chemicals which the Americans used in Vietnam. The Americans sprayed a chemical called Agent Orange on the jungles of Vietnam so it would destroy the leaves of the jungle trees and therefore communists were easier to spot. Now Agent Orange, the chemical the Americans used, was a carcinogen, meaning that it caused cancer. And it also caused mass and horrific birth defects in Vietnamese people after the war. Even until this day, there are entire hospitals of babies who have malformed limbs and brain deformities, and they live their entire lives in cribs and cots, because the American weapons, the Agent Orange which was sprayed, uh, caused a defect in them when they were a fetus, when they are in the mother's womb, and they came out like this, and they spend their entire lives in the hospitals, and die of an early death. Now, you might think that this is an American-only strategy, but no, this was something which was pioneered by the British before the Americans ever set foot in Vietnam. Mass killings of villagers, limiting food, harassing women, putting people in internment camps, and using chemical defoliants by spraying it on the jungle. These were the horrors which the British government doesn't really like to talk about. When people talk about the British Empire, they like to think, oh, we were the, we were the civilized people, we were civilizing the savages. Well, you know, what, what's a savage action? What is terrorism? Is it fighting for independence from an empire? Or is terrorism conducting mass killings of villagers, locking people in internment camps, and using unusual punishment on innocent people who most of them had nothing to do with the insurgents at all, nothing to even do with the communists? The war would last until 1960. Most of the Malaysian communists had been outnumbered, outgunned, outtrained. The very whole force of the British Empire came down on them, and in 1960 they came to a peace truce with the Malaysian government. They did re try to restart the insurgency against the independent Malaysian government to try to re-spark the communist revolution. It lasted for a couple of decades, but it wasn't successful and surrendered again in the 80s. Mass killings of civilians, spraying chemical, chemical defoliants, internment camps, harassing women, killing trade unionists, uh, oppressing this country with the full might of the British Empire. How can it get any worse? The British Empire hired tribal headhunters from Borneo, Dayak tribal headhunters, to hunt down and chop the heads off of people who were suspected of being communists, or people who, were, <clears throat> people who were suspected of fighting for independence. And I have a photograph of one of the uh, decapitated heads here. This is a British Royal Marine posing with the decapitated heads of two people which he has killed. Now, this photograph, along with many others, was released by a British communist newspaper called The Daily Worker. This newspaper is still around today, but it's under a new name. It's now called The uh, Morning Star. The Daily Worker, this British communist newspaper, released the evidence that British soldiers were cutting off people's heads. Now, because it was a communist newspaper, and because the people in the photograph were anonymous at the time, they were later discovered to be real, not many people believe these photographs. I mean, you know, who wouldn't? You know, it's an anonymous photo in a politically charged newspaper. You know, you can understand why people would be sceptical. Now, we've already covered the methods the British used, the internment camps, the harassment of women, mass killings of all males and villagers like Batang Kalai, forcing people into internment camps and cutting off their contact with the outside world. How can it get any worse? Here's the worst part of it. I'm about to show you a photograph 
of a British soldier holding up the decapitated heads of suspected communist anti-colonial freedom fighters. Here they are. Here he is. This is a very infamous photograph. I'll tell you the source in a minute. But if you look very carefully at the woman's head in his uh, other hand there, you will see that the front teeth are missing. Now the front teeth are missing suggests that these people were tortured, probably, you know, a very hard, blunt object, smack them in the face, knocking the teeth out, before these people had their heads chopped off. Tortured before being decapitated. It's like something that ISIS would do. This photograph that you see here was released by a newspaper in Britain called The Daily Worker. The Daily Worker was a communist-aligned newspaper, so they published these photographs to try to uh, dissuade people from supporting the war in Malaysia. Now, because it was a communist newspaper, and because the people in the photographs at that time, they'd later be identified, were not known at the time, people didn't believe it. So there was an investigation by the Admiralty, and the British Empire put a full investigation into these pictures, and uh, a short while later, the British Empire confirmed that these photos were genuine, and that even the man in the photograph here had returned to Britain, was identified, and he confirms that the photograph was real. Colonial Secretary Lighton, who was in charge of the British colonies, he put out the idea that, um, he said this, he said, we cut their heads off because we have to identify the insurgents. If we cut their heads off, we can easily carry it through the jungle when photography equipment is not available in the jungle, and therefore we can identify who these people are. There's one thing wrong with that explanation. You cut people's heads off, the British Empire cut people's heads off so that they can identify people because cameras were not available in the jungle. Then who took the photo? If cameras were not available to identify people with, then who took the photo? Where did that camera come from? And what, you know, the people in the photograph evidence suggests they were fresh killed because of the torture, the blood, and even the leaves in their hair. They were killed very shortly before this photograph was taken. So, you know, who took the picture? You can also see in the bottom, uh, the bottom corner, you can see the full article. The Daily Worker, which is now called the Morning Star, it's still a newspaper around today, is uh, still printing a publication, publications like this under a new name though. Also, I'll show you a larger version of the picture. This is uh, Labour a Party Fit for Imperialism by Robert Clow, a book that I've reviewed in the past. There's a larger, more clearer uh, photograph. You can see the heads there. There we go. Though that photograph was published in 1952 by the Daily Worker, something very important to note is that the British soldiers did not cut these heads off themselves. The British Empire hired Dayak tribal headhunters from Borneo to do the dirty work for them. They tracked the communists in the jungle by the scent of tobacco, smoke and other foods, ambushed them, kill them, and then sliced their heads off and hold it up as a trophy. Uh, you can very clearly see, by the way, that the British soldier is smiling in this photo. It's not for identification, it's just a trophy kill. He just enjoys chopping people's heads off. Chin Peng, leader of the communist guerrillas, heard and saw about this photograph. This is his autobiography, by the way. And he had this to say about the decapitations. At no time, as a liberation commander, first against the Japanese and then against the British, did I ever order the mutilation of enemy bodies, for any reason whatsoever, nor did I condone such excess. I have often pondered what the colonial propagandists would have said had intelligence reports indicated I was seeking from, say, my political bureau colleagues, the same sort of permission Templar sought from his superiors in London to enable ongoing headhunting programme. So what he's saying is, uh, you know, if he cut the heads off somebody, the British and everybody else would hate him and use it for propaganda. But the British were cutting people's heads off, so it was okay, so nobody cared. That's my video on the Malayan emergency, Britain's Vietnam. If you'd like to know more about the war, I highly recommend Chin Peng's autobiography, the leader of the communist guerrilla insurgents. Chin Peng, My Side of History. See the cover. See the back cover. That's him as an elderly man. If you also want to know about Britain's horrible colonial atrocities, I recommend this book, 
which is Labour, A Party Fit for Imperialism by Robert Clough. I have reviewed this book in the past and you can see the link to it in the description. Thank you, I'm Matt Florence. I'm glad you enjoyed my history video on the Malayan emergency. Goodbye.